spiritual matters and essential transcendental meanings. This thematic direction has become the particular provenance of Jungian analytic formulations, because whereas Freud held to the more traditional scientific view that individual humanization meant the secularization of human nature, Jung increasingly came to appreciate the great possibility in reformulationally transitioning human spirituality into the individual not only as, quote, the dignity of man, unquote, but as well the font of all legitimate spiritual experience and revelation autonomously sourced in regard to the ego personality undergoing it. Thus, in Jungian thought, what before was obscuringly imagined to be objectively out there, fabulously, as heaven and hell, angels and devils, is now more realistically reimagined in a carefully analytically parsed out way as subjectively within, still of transcendental constitution, but as such materially existing inside an animated private terrain, as vast as the one without that includes all which has been discovered by Freudian-oriented psychoanalysis, the method Jung held to most seriously and effectively engage the retrospective psyche, those aspects of personal being shaped by prior experiences, and through which one could gain better access to the prospective psyche, that aspect involved with future possibilities, especially those of what Jung often called, quote, numinous, unquote, importance, meaning supernatural, and sacred. Thus is it so that as individual loyalty of being conclusively leaves the group loyalty of outside definition, it can advantageously redeem the severe loss of always reliable collective infla inflation fatefully entailed in that epic orientational shift through constructive self-realization of its own teleological nature in a restorative interiorization of ultimate spiritual reality, practice, and realization. A most fundamental authorizational transfer from the synagogue, church, mosque, etc., the rabbi, priest, imam, etc., the literal heaven and earth, to the individually discrete personal art. Not only the divine become human in this lovely relocational fashion, but the human justly become revaluationally divine as well. This is what you meant by completory psychological individuation. Here is that power mental methodological bridge between the primordial era of human group-mindedness and the more grown-up phase of individual justice, extended most importantly into the realm of spiritual desire and meaning, an ideological step of the greatest expedited possibility, because Nothing motivates human nature that is not at heart legitimately and autonomously felt as divine, it seems to me, and nothing charges up people as much as that incitement conveying the magic of transcendent valuations. Thus, because the evolution of human transpersonal intimacy will lead to the final redemption of, quote, God, unquote, as much as that of imperfectly unconscious human beings, the strongest authority and spiritual potentiality is likewise then correspondingly conveyed significationally to and in the realizational act of wholesome personal individuation, according to Jungian analytic psychology. Now, consider this Jungian humanizational understanding in regard to freely and fairly becoming gay identified in a shamanic alchemical sense we considered before as a legitimate individuational enactment. And one can see in the resulting amplification new symbolic dimensions to basic phenomena, such basic phenomena as homosexual desire, romance, orientation, identity, history, liberty, community, and self-chosen terminology, 
of profoundly expanded scope and import. For example, in terms of the favorable historical evolution of a more individually differentiated ego self access or consciously personalized experience of psychic providence. Not only does such an affirmative Jungian appreciation strategically extend the sense in being same-sex loving as a, quote, natural, unquote, or spontaneous self-particularization legitimizationally into the specific conceptual and applied domains so powerfully explored in the Jungian tradition, as I touched on at greater length in my previous talk, but it does so practically as well in terms of better distilled relationship to that symbolic homosexual divinity which is pictured evocatively as the mythic shining progenitor of gay sex, love, identity, and finer maturational futurity. In my opinion, this is where it starts to truly get more interesting as to the pertinence and worth of developing a gay-centered psychological attitude, meaning a compassionate analytical approach that takes up the viewpoint of subjective gay phenomena themselves, more so useful even than addressing the problems of internalized homophobia and traumatized experience for their own reparative sake, is to justly do so in more progressive order to then be better personally empowered and enabled to develop those transpersonal qualities and possibilities in being valuably homosexual that I have only alluded to so far in passing tonight, as I have mainly tried to stay with the basic notion of homosexual subjective oppression and freedom and the necessary development of gay psychological responsibility for difficult personal issues in order to effectively gain greater inner liberation. But it is the case, in my experience, that as one increasingly attains sufficient psychological competence with one's personally troublesome shadow dynamics, one is further transformed into an adequate partner to all those other aspects and layers of one's experience that invoke and involve transpersonal values and first forces, such that, in consequence, additionally advanced possibilities of good self-realization become practically attainable, involving those greater forces that previously the personality was too weak or immature to adequately handle or even consider. And as such constructive relationship with the transpersonal is cultivated in the activist context of this growing psychological mindedness, it in turn contributes to the improved functioning of subjective self-responsibility because the value of inwardly caring for oneself better is effectuationally enhanced by stronger contact with the inestimably transcendent when that can be sufficiently personally handled. Even though powers beyond the normal or human are always around us and in us, in my opinion, it is another matter entirely to face such powers more directly or purposefully within, where the worth of one's own meaning and integrity will be accordingly provoked. Without a solid and ongoing practice of partnering and dealing with one's shadow side psychologically, in my experience, there cannot be a more practical advancement into better engaging the transpersonal responsibly. That is, without fatal contamination by personally violent, unconscious motives. On the other hand, with the problem of the shadow appropriately identified and accounted for, it also becomes apparent that a fully, ethic, fully ethical psychological responsibility ultimately includes recognition and cultivation of one's personal relations to subjective homosexual numinosity as much as to regressive shadow business as such. Indeed, the shadow itself is numinous in its power, its opposition, its ability to confound. Although it may be hard to appreciate these larger features when one is badly in their grip. Accordingly then, along with coming to terms with one's private issues concerning the conflictual past, there should also be included a more, excuse me, straightforward approach to appreciating how and where the experience of the transcendent is manifesting in regard to the evolutionary future. 
not only in the encounter with the shadow specifically, but in the more pertinent overall context of being gay and growing better as a homosexually maturing psychological and emotional person. I am saying that being gay itself is highly numinous. First of all, in the magic and power of same-sex love. Not only as romantic sexual love, but as homosexual, as involving someone genitally like oneself. A double, double magic, strengthened even better by its relative rarity in the larger society, thus accounting for some of those rather prominent features that could unfortunately most attract the general problem of social scapegoating. But there is more. In loving a person of the same sex, one will feel a stronger commonality with heterosexual people of the opposite sex than with those of similar sex, thus highlighting a much more androgynous relationship to gender than is the parallel case in heterosexual psychology. This androgyny, along with that familiarity to the love object in same-sex bonding, which also contrasts so strongly with heterosexual symbolic relations, both contribute to that transcendent capability in being gay, described in many world cultures of being a bridge between the worlds, say in shamanism, or between the heterosexual genders, as many Native American and other Burdash figures were said to serve. I would even go further and suggest that these androgynous and same-sex loving features are also very germane to interior self-relations, subjectively speaking, that they position the person so endowed to better learn to listen and relate with oneself inside, thus contributing to the evolutionary cultural birth not only of shamanism, but later of more sophisticated spiritual systems, religion, philosophy, science, and psychoanalysis. And on top of that, if we then consider these homosexual features as being selected by the self-differentiating archetypal self to be the subjective ground for a vocally identifying personal ego experience, the sense of a self-awakening homosexual individuality of gay personhood, particularly during this budding post-enlightenment era, still beginning historically of individual enfranchisement, which I have been discussing tonight. With all this profound compounding signification, then it becomes easily imaginable as to how, where, and why being gay today might be numinous, and most importantly so, learning to assume appropriate responsibility for such a rich endowment, then, would surely indicate a markedly significant recovery by a caring, same-sex-loving person from toxic homophobic poisoning. This is where the union contribution to psychoanalytic thought I touched on before can be very useful to a gay-centered psychology in better drawing out the sense of transpersonal homosexual individuation suggested by this talk. Indeed, because of the tremendously appealing significance of the profoundly synthesized ideological direction progressively offered to more advanced political ideologies of subjective liberation, in particular by Jungian analytic methodology, it can well be appreciated that if the overall historical project of psychoanalysis, broadly considered, is finally sufficiently efficacious, then its organizational advent marks initiatory passage to a legendarily novel, psychologically focused age of universally enhanced human growth and functioning for everyone of an entirely unprecedented scope and fertility. The difficulty of working effectively enough to realistically approach such a bounteous global reformation, however, can scarcely be soberly underestimated when we commonly see people around us, gay and straight, and indeed all societies, 
continue avoiding adequate responsibility for those crucial and difficult psychological issues which are so venomously existent in everyone's subjectivity. As we then consider that for those who are homosexual, there is the added challenge of historic and current homophobia, a terrible social evil, most often rampantly present starting within a lesbian or gay child's own family of origin, and aiming to cruelly thwart the wonderful individuational possibilities in being homosexual, I outlined in a suggestive way just before now. 